Hey, listen, I'm not going to keep you long today. We could stay here until 2 o'clock by what the amount of notes I have. But I believe the Lord's been speaking through his spirit and by his people um, about things that are incredibly important. And it's always a, a, a fine balancing act because we never want to be portraying as we don't value the word, we don't teach the word, and we just uh, have an assembly and we gather together. That's, uh, that's not true either. We do we painstakingly go through every verse in the scripture uh, to the point that sometimes uh, we go years on a single book. And uh, today we had Mission Sunday prepared and we had to study on the book of Colossians. We're still going to go there, but briefly, uh, because I believe the Lord uh, was really speaking to the congregation about things that are important as well to live out our faith. It begins with the word, but if we don't live it out, as James tells us, faith without action is dead and I like the word action there I like to translate it action because we often misconstrued that works that's something that we have to do to earn salvation it's not what James is referring to at all he's referring to the word erge means energy faith without action energy is dead and how can we trust Christ if we've never put ourselves in a situation when we trust him how can we trust Christ if he is never able to deliver us from things that we step out in faith to do. And that's what the word faith is. It's not an intellectual agreement. We could all agree today, as I read the word, and uh, Brother Roy and, and Anthony and um, Will shared and, and, and Carol shared, and we could all say, man, I have faith, I agree. But until that turns into an action, where you really depend on Christ to get you out of that situation, it has not developed into faith yet into action yet. You see what I'm saying? If we just sit and agree and say, man, amen, I agree. It's agreement, and I'm glad for agreement, but move on from there, move on from there, and turn it into action, where the Lord says, without action, our faith, um, our faith is dead, James says. And that's the energy, that's the action that is required for faith to really be faith. It requires action. It requires a risk. Can you imagine taking a risk for Christ? My friend, that's faith. <laughs> if it's never a risky, it's never faith. Because you never trust him enough to get you out of it. Um, how can you take risk for Christ? Um, risk is, um, how about sharing Christ? <laughs> that's a big enough risk, is it? In this country, it's, we don't lack the opportunities. Opportunities are there. And I'm speaking for myself. Uh, we lack courage. That's what we lack. That's what I like. I like courage. I have plenty of opportunities. But what we lack the most is courage. And so we pray that the Lord will give us courage to uh, stand before um, people that don't know the Lord and witness to them. Stand before uh, people that are about to perform uh, murder and abortion in front, of, in front of us and be able to witness to them in love and truth and sincerity, with conviction, with reality. And I like the word reality in the Bible. The word truth in the Bible is the word reality. When we talk about truth, it's the same word. You can translate it the same way. Every time you see the word truth in the Bible, it's the word reality, both Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Jesus is the way, the reality, right? Truth, reality, and the life. It's real. His life is real, right? He's full of grace and truth. Grace and reality. You have the truth in your hearts. You have the reality in your hearts. That's what you have when you have Christ. So turn to Colossians chapter 1. I'm not going to keep you long, I said. I'm just going to touch on something that um, I believe pertains to today's message um, and what we talked about. And uh, uh, when we're sharing about missions and we're sharing about uh, what to do and, and the evils of our world and how to stand up to them, especially. Uh, regarding abortion, regarding the persecuted church. By the way, uh, many of you guys are wearing um, the shirts that from this ministry uh, are, are, are printed. I don't say from us necessarily, but from people in our fellowship. Uh, Jeff and Alex are not here. They're um, not here on this Sunday, but they um, Vessel T prints shirts that uh, pertains to the persecuted churches. Chris, you have one. Does anyone else have them? Some of you guys have them. Some of them in the back. 
You have them. Can you guys stand up real quick? I don't want to be models. I don't want to show models or anything like that. Where's Dwight? He had another one. Huh? You got one, Tony, right? She's got the other one. She's got the other one? Oh, but she's really shy. She doesn't stand up. <laughs> um, but we print them as part of us, part, part of our fellowship. And uh, if you would like to wear them and demonstrate uh, that you're standing for the persecuted church, you can definitely uh, get yourself um, a pair of shirts, a couple of shirts, three shirts, however you want. It Basically, it's the, the sign that it's, it's the letter N for uh, in Arabic, Nun, uh, which is the first letter of the word for Nazarene. That's what they call Christians in, in, in the Islamic world, Nazarenes. And uh, they actually, ISIS uh, paints those those signs, letter N, on Christian businesses and schools or churches before they attack them. And so as Christians, we stand for them and with them and pray for them and with them. Uh, and the support, if you buy the shirt, that money goes right into ministries that are on the ground floor with the persecuted church, like Voice of the Martyrs, like Barnabas Aid, uh, are important ministries that help churches in those, um, uh, and Christians in those areas, not with just they rebuild churches, but also give them Bibles and discipleship material. So we want to pray for them as well. And um, that was taking action. You know, we did something about it. And so hopefully we did some, we do something about the ones we talked about today. Not just in theory, not just good talks and agreements, but action. Faith without action, energy, is dead. So as a fellowship, we um, invite you, myself included, uh, let's have some action on this. Let's do something about what we can do in the Lord. And um, the first, is it third? So it's the 17th or 18th. It's the uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. Well, 17th, 17th. And um, we talked about bringing Pastor Al back. We loved him. It was, it was fantastic. And any of you guys, some of you guys, who was not here when Pastor Al was here? Who was not here? You didn't hear Pastor Al Howard. Okay. We got to bring him back. And... <laughs> And um, what he talked about is excellent, and it's on live stream as well. You can watch his, um, the, the service there. And, um, but we also, um, at the end of this month, we're also going to have uh, um, Jay Siegert from Creation Ministries. What is the official name of his, of his ministry? Well, do you remember? I don't, I don't remember. I, I think it's Creation Ministry. Creation Science. Creation Science, yeah. Yeah, I know he's in Minnesota, and um, he's going to be here on a Sunday night. So... Um, I would like this place to be filled up. Jay's a good brother. You've probably seen some stuff online and ministries on YouTube, uh, teachings on YouTube that he has. Uh, it's going to be a Sunday night. Um, let's pack out the place. When Pastor Al comes, let's pass, pack out the place because these are real issues of life where Christians need to be involved in the gospel and the truth. So Colossians 1, uh, let's, let's, ask, let's ask the Lord to bless our time together here in the next few minutes. Father, we honor you, Lord. We worship you as God. Jesus, you are God, and we worship you. And we thank you that, Lord, you are in the midst of the church, walking to and fro, and in the midst of the candlesticks, it says in Revelation, and you're well aware, Lord, of everything that's going on within the church. Father, may you see this fellowship, this ministry, this, uh, in such a need that you would help us, that you would bring us, Lord, your grace and your spirit, and you empower us, Lord, to do your will. You know the hearts of all, all those here today, Lord. You know the hearts of those who are not here today. And Lord, you desire for your body to be active, salt, light, in a world that needs desperately truth, reality. Lord, we live in a world where truth and reality are subjective. They've been turned upside down. It's relative. Lord, we need your standards. We need your truth. We need your reality to be the center of our lives, to be the the, the plumb line in which we can build, in which we can move and live and have our being. Lord, Father, we thank you. Give us the word today, Lord, and what we have to share, even if it's for a short time. Give us ins insight, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a big, big pot of soup after this service, so I welcome you to stay. So don't, um, if you can help it. <laughs> Don't run down to In-N-Out or Denny's or wherever you're going to go to. And um, fellowship with us. There's enough food for everyone. But we do that just to encourage you and to um, encourage you to faith and good works, the Bible says, to love and good works.
Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace, and, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, for which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you have learned it from Epaphras, our beloved bondservant, who is a faithful servant on Christ, uh, of Christ on our behalf. He has also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Um, we're going to have to do this part two because to go through the whole eight verses, it takes, it takes quite a bit because there's so much here. In fact, this is the, the eight verses are the envelope of the letter. Uh, if you understand the way letters were written in the old time, the ancient times, you, you would have the greetings and who was addressed to and who wrote it on the very top of the letter, which is very practical if you think about it. Very practical, and it had a seal on it. And uh, the, whoever the mail carrier would have it, they would unleash or untie the seal suggest that they can take a peek who wrote it and who it was sent to before they deliver it and then deliver it to the recipient. And this is what this is. They call that the envelope. It was just the, the first part of it. And this is what the eight verses are all about. We call it the envelope because it's not really the full aspect of the letter. It's just the beginning. It's just the envelope. You take an envelope and you open it up and you say, oh, okay, it's from, you know, at so-and-so. And, -so and uh, it's, it's, it's for me. That's what this is. eight verses are all about. And the first part of the letter has a greeting, has a, some kind of um, um, relationship that they have with each other, and also some good things to say about them. And Paul addresses that. I'm only going to touch on a few things because it's so hard to, uh, for the next 10 minutes to do it. But the greeting of his people, the greeting of God's people, look what it says in verse 2. Um, we'll talk about Paul and Apostle next week. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big subject, especially in the churches today. Uh, Paul being an apostle in the will of God. But verse 2, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. This is written to saints. Uh, this is written to believers. This is written to people that are God's saints. Now, this idea of saints, of course, has been misconstrued. Um, it, it just means holy ones or those who are separated by God to do his work. That's all it means. Those who have been separated by God to do his work. These are the saints. The saints, brethren... Brethren in Christ, but not just all brethren. Look what it says in, in just in verse 2 in between saints and brethren. It says faithful. Faithful brethren. Faithful brethren in Christ. Who are these? These are the people of God in the fellowship in Colossae who are in Christ and also live in Colossae. Faithful. Faithfulness, Paul said in the, in the book of Corinthians, it is required that a man or a woman in ministry, it's required that they be faithful. Faithful. Jesus is the faithful witness, right? He wants his people to be faithful. What is faithful? Faithful is somebody who is um, literally, the word is full of faith, full of commitment, full of uh, uh, ones who are going to stick it out until the end. Better way of saying it, commonly. One who will stick it out until the end is those who are faithful. These are the ones that Paul is talking to them. Uh, people that will not leave when difficult times come. People who are going to stick it out until the end, no matter what happens. And in a fellowship, this is really how the fellowship is built. Um, many people come to church, you know that. But how many of them are faithful? Another word, another word of saying faithful is consistent. Who is consistent? Faithful and consistent. Um, it's, it's referring to uh, those who can be counted on, those who can be counted on. And, and uh, I praise God for people in this ministry that are faithful, can be counted on, um, those who you can build the ministry around. Um, I've been around in ministry since I got saved 20 years, full-time, uh, in a sense full-time, I still work bivocationally, but uh, 10 years here in this ministry. And um, I can tell you one thing, if you find somebody who's faithful, oh man, don't let them go. It's so hard to find anybody who's faithful. They say a lot of things, but consistency can be counted on. You can build a ministry around faithful people. 
You cannot build a ministry around inconsistency. It's really difficult. And Paul says to them, you are the saint, you are the faithful, you are the faithful brethren. You are the consistent ones who are in Colossae, but also in Christ. A Christian has two addresses. One is where you live temporarily. The other one is where you live consistently and eternally. A Christian lives in two places. Right now, you live in two places. You might live in Devore, you live in Fontana, you live in Redlands, you live in Irvine, you live in different places. That's where you temporarily live, but your real address is in Christ. Your real place where you live is Christ. Therefore, you can handle the things of this world. You can deal with the paganism of Colossae, Paul is saying. You are in the center of this trade route that if you, if you weren't here last week, you can listen to it. The, the cultural, historical, geographical background of Colossae, where they were at. It's something that uh, they had to deal with. Paganism and influences that were coming into, especially the church. And in Colossae, they say, you are in Colossae, but you are in Christ. You live there, but you are withstanding the avalanche of paganism and things that are coming against the church because you are in Christ. That's what Paul was referring to. You are in Christ. You are in Colossae, but you're in Christ. You might be at CCOD today in Devore, but you are in Christ. That's the best address to be. That's the best place to be eternally. And of course, it has the most influence on you. It should. It should. If you say, well, I live in uh, San Bernardino County, and, uh, but I'm also in Christ, which has the most influence in your life? Are you becoming more like Christ, like your eternal address, or is it your temporary address that has the most influence on you? Our behavior will tell us it all, doesn't it? Our behavior tells it all. Do we behave? Paul could have said, hey, you're behaving like the Colossians. Or are you behaving like the saints who are in Christ in Colossae? Let our behavior be the one of Christ. But of course, we don't run away from society. We don't just live in a mountain and say, I'm not going to have anything to do with anybody. That asceticism is also incorrect. And, and unfortunately, even in the first century church, there was a lot of, uh, even in the Jews, among the Jews, they pulled away from society. They said, it's too evil, it's too crazy, it's too nutty, I want nothing to do with it, I'm just going to go and live in the Qumran caves. And that's what they did. That's where you found the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was among the, 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 uh, the Jews who lived at the time, um, who were away from society. And some Christians have done that too. I'm not going to be away from everybody, I'm just not going to deal with society, I'm going to pull away. And Paul says, that's not right either. Who can be salt and light if everybody's pulled away? He says, you're in Colossae, but you're in Christ. That has the most influence in you. I want to go, uh, I'm running out of time very quickly, but I want to go to where Paul talks about in, in verse 4. Actually, just we'll read verse 3. Give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. And because of the hope that's laid out for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel. Three things. I want to make sure I found all my notes. Three things. This is, this is like a real short message. Three things. Faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope is the mark of a true believer in a good, healthy ministry, by the way. Somebody's trying to get a hold of somebody. Uh, <laughs> Faith, love, and hope. It's not just found here. We oftentimes think of 1 Corinthians, right? Faith, hope, and love. But it's also found in Thessalonians. It's also found here. The marks of a true Christian is faith. And the faith in Jesus has nothing to do with, like we talked about it, has nothing to do with an agreement. It has something to do with stepping out and relying on the Lord. I guess you could ask this question. When was the last time you trusted in Jesus? When was the last time you trusted in Jesus? Well, I went out witnessing the other day, and I stepped out in faith, and if the Lord wasn't in it, I would have fallen flat on my face. I'm glad the Lord was in it. That's the last time I trusted in Jesus. You see the difference? It's not in agreement with the facts. It's when is the last time you really trusted him. Well, we got these guys down the street, and we wanted to give them some Bibles. I don't know how they were going to receive it, but we did it. We went out and shared. 
Anthony trusted in Jesus. He went out to see some orphans. As James says, that's true spirituality, true religion. People that step out in faith, who go and pray for uh, those who are contemplating abortion at the abortion clinics. When was the last time you trusted in Jesus? As Will will tell, uh, as uh, Bill will tell you, he trusted in Jesus when he goes out and witnesses and with a megaphone and, and witnesses through his uh, the preaching of the gospel um, in different places that he goes to. That's trusting in Jesus. You see what I'm saying? It's not just for you to give me a thumbs up and say, "Man, I agree with everything you said today." That's not faith. That's agreement. We like agreements, right? We kind of we go. We're, agreements are safe. Agreements are safe. Um, he says, your faith, I heard of your faith. How did you hear of a faith? If it's just agreement, right? Faith. And that, that you're in love with all the saints, the love that you have for all the saints. Um, a church is not a clique. I know it's a battle, isn't it? Because we like the people we like, and we like the people that like us. And... Um, <laughs> And we like the people that can do something for us. And we like the people that are kind of like us. And if, you're, uh, if you're into something, you kind of like them more, right? But um, if somebody's not real sociable, it's hard to talk to them, isn't it? Um, Paul says here, look, love for all the saints. Uh, not just the ones who don't talk. <laughs> not just the ones you relate to. Not those are the ones who are like you, but those who are different. The ones that are different. The ones who have a different background and maybe age. Believe me, I, um, you know the word in the Bible for uh, um, an overseer. It's the word episcopos, right? Episcopo comes from the word, um, well, the idea comes the idea of somebody overseeing something. Telescope, we get a word from that, right? Somebody who watches, and I watch. I'm not watching you specifically, but just watch how the fellowship is going, ministries and Something's going on, or and um, I tend to look that we're cliquish. I tend to look that we're cliquish. Um, we like certain people. We don't really want to talk to other people. I know you didn't want to hear that on the first Sunday of uh, New Year's, right? But that's what Paul is referring to. <coughs> Your love for all the saints. I'll take it a step further. How about the saints who are not here, who are being persecuted? Has anyone ever written to them? Has anyone ever taken a pen or an email and just said, you know, I love you, brethren. I, I don't know you. I haven't met you, but I'm going to write you a letter of encouragement. Paul says, you have a love for all the sins. This is a great church, Colossae. It's a great church. They have love for all the brethren, faith, love, not just those they like, but those who were all the saints, right? All the saints, not just in this fellowship, but around, around the world. And, and believe me, um, you can't be isolated anymore in this world. We live in a globalist society now. As bad as that would be in one aspect of it, you can look at it the other aspect. I can relate to all believers around the world. because so I can talk to them. We can talk to Jasper. He's all across the other side. We can talk in, to Mexico, believers in Mexico. But we can write a letter to the persecuted church in Syria. We have no reason why we shouldn't be loving all the saints that we possibly can. Not in this fellowship, not only in this fellowship, but they have a hope. And it all starts with hope, by the way. Because of the hope, verse 5 says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. It begins with hope. Did you know, realize that we're teaching on Ecclesiastes on Wednesday? And one of the things that we read about the most in this man, Koholeth, the philosopher, is that he had no hope. He looked at life under the sun, and he said it's hopeless. He looked at life in this lifetime, within his life, and he said, and it's all vanity, it's all meaningless. He had lost the hope. And we always go back to the New Testament, right, when we're reading it, and we compare it to the New Testament, because the New Testament is the answer to Ecclesiastes. There is hope. Because you have hope that's beyond the grave, because you have the hope that Jesus is coming, because you have the hope that there is a, another life, another world, that it's invisible to a certain degree, you have a great hope beyond this life. You can love, you can, have, you can trust in God, you can trust in Jesus. You know, when a Christian loses hope beyond the grave, it's when a Christian basically becomes isolated. Because what's the reason to love? 
what's the reason to have trust in Jesus? What's the reason to have trust in God and, and trust in that there's no hope beyond this world? We might as well just work and enjoy all the money that we can make. But that's what Koholet was doing. That's what Ecclesiastes is about. He says, you know what? It's so meaningless. A man should just rather work, build up his income, and just live up the income for the rest of his life and just live it up because there's nothing else beyond this world. But he was wrong. He was destitute. He, was, he was, couldn't figure out. He was born too soon, I said. Because once you know the New Testament, you know that everything that you do has a, a reality, a truth in it. For Jesus' sake, for the, for the one that's to come, for the kingdom that's to come, that's what we do. That's why we love the brethren, because there's a kingdom to come. And you're going to be with them. If they're born again, you're going to be with them for the rest of eternity. Love them. Why do we have faith? Because Jesus is coming back, and we need to get everyone that we possibly can into his kingdom. It all starts with hope. And we look forward to what God has for us. This is not all that God has for us. I hope you, met, you, under, you get that point. This is just a foretaste of what God has for us. For who can know what God has for us? It has not entered into the mind of man. So the, this hope that is laid up for us in heaven, is this, of which you previously heard, in the truth of the gospel. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. It's called the truth here. It's called, I told you what the gospel, what the word truth is, right? In the, in the Greek language, it's translated to English, you can say the reality. You know what reality is? It's the gospel. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, lived the perfect life, went to the cross to die for my sins, rose again to give us eternal life, to give us his righteousness, that if I have faith and repentance, I can be born again. That's the gospel. That's the reality, my friends. That's reality whether you like it or whether you don't. That's the reality that God will measure the whole entire universe by. And it's on our tongue. And it's on our lips. And it's on your mind. And it's on your, and it should be, on our action. And it says, all of that is made possible because of the gospel. 30 years had, had happened since Jesus ascended to heaven from this point. 30 years before Jesus ascended to heaven. Fast forward 30 years later, Paul says, this gospel that was heard, the truth, verse 6, has gone into all the world, the known world. Paul wanted to go to Spain, had gone as far as India, South as Africa, he had gone to the whole world. We only know a little bit about it because the Bible only deals with the book of Acts, right? The book of Acts is Paul's journey from chapter 13 on. It's Paul's journey to the Western world to Europe, to Greece, as far as Spain, right? We are not privileged to know, biblically, what happened in Turkey. I mean, I'm sorry, what happened in uh, India, what happened in Africa, what happened as it went out to the Orient. It, it happened in great numbers, by the way. There were so many Christians in Syria, in India, in Egypt, but we're not told because the Bible only focuses on the most difficult route. The most difficult route was Europe. That was the most difficult place to share the gospel because of Greek philosophy and the Roman Empire as the most hardest place to witness. Turkey, I mean, um, uh, India, Africa, they embraced the gospel. Thomas, Matthew, they all went to those places and they embraced, there were thousands of Christians. We're only told about Europe, the book of Acts. But Paul said it had gone to the whole world. It literally had in 30 years, it had gone to the whole world. Think about that, how fast that spread. Why did it go out? Well, a few things. The gospel has life in and of itself. Think about that. The gospel has life in and of itself. Meaning that you can give a gospel tract to someone and they could read it and they could be born again without you helping them. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. I have read testimony. My favorite testimonies are people that get saved without ever meeting a Christian. They're amazing testimonies. Um, I read of one, uh, uh, a man in Tunisia, when the French occupied it. And uh, he was a Jew, and he became a believer. He was, became a, a, a full Jew, we would call it. A Jew who believed in Jesus, right? Why? He read the New Testament in French. Somebody gave him the New Testament in French, and he read it other Jewish believers that have come to Jesus that way. Many, many people have come to Jesus by somebody giving them a Bible 
and they never saw him again. A New Testament tract, never saw him again. And they read it, and they became born again. The gospel has in and of itself life. It has divine authority. It has power from God. As Paul said, it is the power of God. It's the greatest power in the universe is the gospel. The greatest power. It has divine authority. It's sharp. It's quick. It's active. It's alive. You can give it to somebody and see it grow. It just germinates. It germinates inside of you, and they just grow. Grow, 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 right? We all must grow. We all must grow. But the power of the gospel needs a human channel as well. It says that the gospel has gone out and bearing fruit in your life since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. It needs a human channel. The, uh, uh, the gospel, yes, it's alive, but we must share it. Um, discover what the gospel can do when you open your mouth. You're unleashing a power that is unlike anything you've ever experienced in your life. You just want to see what it does. Go try it. <laughs> it unleashes the power of God unto salvation. You realize, the po- think of the power of God. And I know I'm, I'm going over. And I know that when I tell you're short, it doesn't mean much. But I am trying to finish. Uh, I am trying to finish. But think about this. The power of God. How much power was it to create the universe? Amazing power. Think about the, the galaxies and orbits and and, and, and things that we haven't even seen. The Hubble telescope is trying to figure out how far this goes. We don't even know. That's power. Out of nothing, God created it. But God is not creating things anymore like that. Where is his power residing? In the gospel. Think about that. That's why to the Corinthians, it was so foolishness. Paul said it's foolishness to them to think that a Messiah crucified is the power of God. Because a Messiah is a king. He's not crucified. Who would heard of a king dead? A dead king that has power? Nobody. And yet, it's where God in his, I'm going to use the word foolishness, in his foolishness has re- decided to put all his power in, in a message that the wisdom of man cannot understand it. Wouldn't God decide to do it some different way? Yeah, he could have, but he didn't. He decided to put it in people's hearts and minds and mouth so that they can be partakers of what God is doing. And the most powerful message in the world is a message that the world may go, that is so foolish to think of a, I'm going to be saved by somebody who died? I mean, death gives me life? Yeah, my friend, but not any kind of death. It was the death and the resurrection of God. He died for you so that you wouldn't have to. And that is the power of God. It's the power that needs a human channel, the words of life that explode out of your mouth into someone's heart to see them grow. And they had a good example. Look what it says in verse 7. They had Epaphras. He was a faithful man, it says, servant of Christ on our behalf. And of course, in verse 8 it says, He also informed us of your love in the Spirit. The gospel also has a communication, a communion. Uh, um, yeah, communication, you could say it, uh, of believers set up by the Spirit. The things that are happening in, this, in your life or in someone's life can be heard of by someone, can be understood by somebody who says, man, God's doing a work in Syria or in San Bernardino or wherever you live, that your testimony can go to the whole world and can be heard and read or listened to by someone. How many of you guys have a testimony? Only two people are saved. Three people are saved? <laughs> oh, four people are saved. All right. Five people. Okay. How many of you guys have a testimony? If you're born again, you do. Has anyone heard it? Does anyone know? I'd love to hear them. Not today. I'd love to hear them. How many of you guys ever put it on uh, audio? A few of you guys, yeah. And they've gone out. I know Chris has gone out. I know Bill has gone out to different parts. Different people have heard it. And in these age of communication, they can be heard around the world. Paul says, Epaphras came to Rome to tell me all that you're doing, your faith, your love, and your hope. And I heard it. That communication is by 
the Spirit. It creates a real bond, a real fellowship, a real consistency of believers getting to know the circumstances that you deal with and praying for you and praying for each other. Paul says, oh, I heard about you. Have they heard about us? Hopefully they have. If Paul wants to write this letter to this church or to your community, and he would start off, you know, Paul, a, a faith, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the believers who are at CCOD or Fontana or the surrounding areas, what would it say? Some of you cringe when you ask those questions, right? What would it say? Paul said to another church, you are an epistle, a living epistle, known and read by all men. That's true. You are a living epistle, read and known by all men. If that is true, what do they read? What do they read? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing today, your goodness, your mercy. Father, we ask you that you would help us and understand your word. Lord, we win. We, we talked about so many different things. I pray, Lord, that in your grace, all of it would come together and people would understand the need to take action, the need to be partakers in the gospel because it's the, it's the work of God. It's the action, Lord, that you have. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he makes it possible by his death, his resurrection, and his coming again. It gives us that hope. We can do things for Christ because we have hope. We have hope that this is not the end. We, we have hope that this is not all that there is, that there's more to what God has prepared for those who love him. Lord, and it's not a hope as the wishful thinking that we have in this world, but it's a, it's a hope of a true fact waiting to come to pass. Lord, as we wait for that hope to appear, we live in that hope now. And help us, Lord, to become channels of the gospel so we can go out and perhaps not in a, in, 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 in a setting where hundreds of people are coming to you, Lord, but maybe one-on-one, -on -one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe ten. Lord, we don't lack opportunities. We lack courage. So give us courage, Lord, to do so. By the power of the gospel, Lord, that we don't have to make it up. It's powerful in and of itself. Thank you, Lord. You've given us that power to do something with it. <sighs> Father, thank you that all this, you did not leave us orphans. You gave us your Holy Spirit to make it real, to make it possible, to make it available for us, but also to be able to get it done. Please, Lord, we ask you for your filling of your Holy Spirit, for the strength and the courage and the wisdom that you give, Lord, each one, Lord, each family, each member of this fellowship. Thank you for them. May you bless them, Lord, in the gospel. May you bless them, Lord, in Christ. May you bless them, Lord, with many more opportunities and, and courage to do your will. Thank you, Lord. And we ask you to bless our time together, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a final song. Would you please stand? And we will sing it unto the glory of God. The gospel is not something you agree with. Only. The gospel is something you defend. The gospel is something you live. And the gospel is something you pass on. Those three things. Remember those three things. In fact, when we did the study on Timothy, that was the basis of it. You defend it, you live it, and you pass it on. If we can't do those three things, then... We lack not opportunities, we lack courage. And God wants to give us courage. He wants to make us defenders of the faith, proclaimers of the faith, and living out our faith. That's Christianity in full, in the full aspects of it. You, know, what it, you want to know what it, what it is like to live like Christ, do those three things. Defend it, live it, and share it. My friend, you will not have a boring life. It will be exciting. It will be powerful, if you think, you know, what power God can give us. And it will be unto his glory. And you can't wait to pass it on because you have a hope greater than this life, greater than what you have today. And uh, if you ran out of hope today, 
That's because we, we took our eyes off the Lord. We took our eyes off of Him and His return. Because He gives us the hope. Why you do what you do is because Jesus is coming. And you need to get on it. Let's sing this song to the glory of God.